All right, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Rebuilding Financially After Domestic Violence, Gaining Financial Self-Sufficiency. All right, I just made a couple of announcements offline about handouts and questions. You should have that covered by now. Great, and um, we're so excited to have you here. All right, a couple of other just housekeeping announcements before we actually get into our presentation. Take a look at your handouts drop down. We have what's called Webinar One Handouts, and we have a number of financial education activities there. So you're gonna to wanna to keep that, save it, print it, or however you like to access that. But we're gonna be referring to those activities throughout the webinar. So make sure you have that available to you and print it out later, possibly, or now. All right, so um, lastly, we are going to be sharing a recording of the webinar with everyone uh, via our follow-up email that will go out tomorrow. All right, so my name is Sheba McCants. I'm the Outreach Programs Manager for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and I'm joined today by Jeanette Schultz. She is the Director of Financial Workshop Initiatives for NEFI. So um, we're gonna be doing a little bit of co-presenting today, so feel free to um, kind of just go with us. We're gonna be going back and forth. Mm -hmm. I mentioned questions, we're gonna be, we have questions we have time for questions built in throughout the webinar. So feel free to, to chat us in a question via the questions box in your control panel. All right, so we are ready to start. I have a number of polls that we are going to administer right now. And um, so feel free to go ahead and, and interact with us. Tell us a little bit about who you are so that we know who is in our webinar audience. So why don't we get started with the first poll? So this is who is participating today? So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself via the poll. You could select multiple answers there. Are you, uh, are you an advocate? Do you identify as a survivor? Are you a case manager, part of the legal system? And then if you have other job titles, if you wanna chat those in via the questions box, that'd be great. We have a therapist in the house, program assistant, awesome. Thank you guys so much. All right, why don't we close that poll up? All right, and via the poll system, we are seeing that 83% of you are identifying as domestic violence or sexual assault advocates. That's a high percentage, wow, that's really awesome. 11% of you are identifying as victims or survivors, 26% are identifying as case managers or counselors, and then a few, a few folks from the legal or law enforcement bracket. All right, let's go ahead on to the next. Where are you located? So we just like to get a sense for where our participants are, are tuning in to the webinar from. So where are you located? Let's get plenty more people voting here. Thank you for voting. We appreciate that. We're getting close. Let's keep going. Awesome work. Okay, let's go ahead and close that. So we are seeing 36% of you are from the East Coast. 19 or is it 13% are from the West Coast? 21 from the Midwest, 22 from the Southern states, and 7% from the mountain region. Wow. And we are actually joining in from the mountain region yes. today in Denver. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next. All right, so what is your racial or ethnic identity? And uh, with this one also, you're able to select multiple responses. So feel free to indicate there how you identify in terms of your racial or ethnic identity. It's always interesting for us to know sort of who's on the webinar today. So, okay, we can go ahead and close that one. Awesome response uh, response numbers there, thank you. Uh, so we, we're at 16 or 61% are identifying as white or Caucasian, 17% black, African or African American, 15% Hispanic or Latinx, 3% American Indian or Alaskan Native, and then another 3% Asian or Pacific Islander. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next. Two more polls. All right, uh, what types of programming does your organization offer? This is really interesting for us to know. What types of programming are you all running or a part of running? And what types of services or programs does your organization offer as a whole? Let's get some more votes in. We know that, well, I'm already seeing that a lot of us are operating multiple types of programs and offering many services in our communities. 
Okay, that looks good. Let's close that up. All right, awesome. 88% of us are involved in some kind of advocacy work or case management services, whether that's legal advocacy, family advocacy. Another 86% are offering support groups, counseling, or supportive services. 80% are, are offering emergency shelter and or tr transitional housing in their communities. 75% are offer, offering community engagement and prevention activities. And then if you wanna just quickly chat in any of those other other types of programming that you may be offering. That'd be great. All right. All right, let's go ahead to the last poll. This is a really interesting question, and I particularly want to point this one out uh, because it'll help us know who we're really speaking to today. So how many for you, are you doing this, web this webinar for you? Is it that you want to learn about personal finance, or are you doing this webinar for those that you serve? Do you have clients that need this information? So kind of what was your motivation to get on the webinar today? All right, we can close that. Wow, that's super helpful for us to know. 95% um, of you have joined this webinar today because that you need this information for clients that you serve. That's really informative for us. So thank you so much for sharing and we will just go ahead and get into the webinar content. All right, thank you guys so much for doing those polls. I really appreciate it. And uh, before we get into the objectives, I wanted to take a moment to define what is economic abuse? So we are, most of us as advocates, we're familiar with the power and control wheel. And that was developed uh, by, it was the Duluth model, so domestic abuse intervention programs. And on the power and control wheel, economic abuse is defined as preventing someone from getting or beginning a job making a partner ask for money, giving a partner an allowance, taking a partner's money, or not letting a partner know or have access to family income. So that's just a little review from the power and control wheel. Furthermore, economic abuse involves maintaining control over finances or financial resources. So withholding access to money in an attempt to prevent a victim or survivor from working and or attending school in an effort to create financial dependence as a means of control. So really it's, it's all about power and control. Um, and it, it has always been there on our power and control wheel. Victims and survivors are oft, often forced to choose between staying in an abusive relationship and possibly even poverty or homelessness. So economic abuse is, very, is a common reason why victims choose to stay in abusive relationships. Economic abuse can take on many forms, including employment-related abuse, preventing the victim from accessing existing funds, coerced debt, and more. I want to share four statistics with you all about economic abuse. And these actually came from an NCADV blog post, which I'm going to be sure to include in the follow-up email for today. It was, a, it was a blog post that talked about economic abuse. And um, some of you may be familiar with some of these statistics, but feel free to click on that, click on the PowerPoint for the sources of each one. So between 94 and 99% of domestic violence survivors have also experienced financial abuse. Between 21 and 60% of victims of intimate partner violence lose their jobs due to reasons stemming from domestic abuse. A survey by the Corporate Alliance to End Partner Violence found that respondents who were victims or survivors, 64% reported their abuse impacted their ability to work. 40% responded that their abuser harassed them at work via phone or in person. And the last stat I'll share is that victims of intimate partner violence lose a total of 8 million working days of paid work each year. Wow. And that's the equivalent of 32,000 jobs. Wow. So really kind of putting it all in perspective, um, as to really how many people and how many victims that we may be working with on a daily basis are, are experiencing financial abuse and or are trying to rebuild their lives after financial abuse. You all may know from your work as advocates that victims of domestic violence may be unable to leave an, an abusive partner or may be forced to return to an abusive partner for economic reasons. 
Victims of domestic violence face many barriers, gaining financial self-sufficiency, including struggling to find a job or even obtain a place to live after leaving an abusive relationship due to debt and its detrimental effects on their personal credit scores. Now that we have properly defined economic abuse, let's take a quick pause for any questions that everyone might have so far. So does anybody have any questions about how we're defining economic abuse or is there anything that you want us to kind of further clarify as far as what we're talking about today and or the objectives that we have for today's session? All right, um, my, my system is kind of, it's not allowing me to see your questions. Okay, wait, no, I think I've got it. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Let's keep okay. moving, we'll All just right. keep going. So we're gonna cover five different objectives today and we can't do it comprehensively. We are gonna touch on it a little bit, but in your feedback, if you like to share what you like to hear more, we can also put that together in a future webinar. The first one is preventing financial abuse. The second is identifying your current financial situation. Third is addressing your housing issues. Fourth is consider workplace options. And last, developing a job hunting plan. In order to prevent financial abuse, it is important to understand that some abusers use it to seek revenge. Financial abuse can happen both while a victim is in a relationship with their abuser, as well as after a relationship has ended. Here are some of the ways that financial abuse can look. An abuser can attempt to destroy the victim's credit rating, which can make it difficult for them to obtain future loans, rent an apartment, or even get a job. An abuser may use a credit card or bank statement to track down a former partner. For example, let's say you flee your Seattle home and are staying with your mother in Orlando. If you continue using your credit card, your abusers may see those uh, charges in Orlando and put two and two together and track you down. A couple more tips for preventing abuse. Change your uh, PIN number. That's your four digit number on accounts, computer passwords, website passwords, anything, especially um, benefit plans. It is important to transfer or put new personal accounts, paychecks, inheritance, spare change into a personal bank or credit union account as soon as it is safe to do so. Make sure these accounts cannot be accessed by the abuser. Collect all paperwork and all email documentation that lists social security numbers, passwords, clues to passwords like mother's maiden name. This information could be used to fraudulently open an account in the, in the victim's names. It may not be possible to physically remove all your personal information so that the abuser can access it. And in this case, victims may consider whether getting a new social security number might be helpful. This will help prevent fraud, but the survivor may have to give up credit history um, that they have built under the old number. A couple more tips to help those you serve to prevent financial abuse. If possible, it can be helpful to focus on paying off the balances on joint credit cards, which makes it easier to close the accounts and prevent future debt incurred by the abuser. If this is not possible, you may be able to call the issuers of any joint accounts and request that their names be removed. This step will not protect an individual from any existing debt, but it is, but this may limit responsibility for future charges made by the abuser. It can also be helpful to send a copy of any court orders to credit reporting agencies and credit card companies where survivors have accounts. This may help explain their extenuating circumstances and help the participant qualify for credit in the future. Now that we've discussed preventing financial abuse, let's take a quick pause for any questions that anyone might have on this section. All right, we did have a question that came in about um, what is the timeline for changing a social security number? It says, it sounds like that would take a long time and bring attention to changes. And I don't have a fast and hard um, rule on that. I would we would have to research that because it does change year to year. So we'll we'll get back to you. Sure. And I would imagine also that it could be different in different areas of the country. Um, but I would look at that one as a little bit more of a long term change. So if you were really kind of thinking about long term, you know, rebuilding financially, that would be one of the steps you would take. 
there are certainly other steps that I think are a little bit more short term and in the immediate. But I do think that um, the changing of the Social Security number that would be looked at as like a long term, more permitted change. All right. And we have a couple more questions. So what would you suggest for domestic violence or sexual assault impacted individuals who do not have credit or debit cards? Um, we've, I've encountered this question before and have researched a little bit into it. Um, it's just a tip. It's not something for you to follow, but there are banks that will allow you to uh, put to 300 in a credit card and use it as a debit. And that credit, you can build that credit as as long as you pay it on time every month. Um, as, and when you do pay it on time, the bank or the credit card company can issue more credit as you build that credit report. Always paying your bills on time, I know that's a very slow process, is the one that will make you um, a better um, credit report rating um, in the long run, but it does take time and you do have to have practice your patience and diligence in doing that. Awesome. We do have a couple of more questions on this uh, section. So if it's a joint card, it's, is it possible to ask your name to be removed from the account? If so, would you ask the financial corporation directly? Most times, um, and this has happened to me personally, a credit card company has removed my name from a credit card where my ex-husband was using it um, too much for too much for me to handle. So I asked my name to be removed. Um, and the credit card company was helpful in that way, but there are companies that won't do that. So it really depends on the credit card company and what they will and will not allow. Um, you just have to call them and just be proactive in doing that. I can't promise any um, positive results, but in my case, it happened in, in a good way. Awesome, and another question. Do you know about the repayment strategies in how to pay down debt? And I think um, that one we're going to cover in a, a future section. We're going to be talking a little bit more about debts and liabilities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a different section. Um, couple, we, you all have a lot of great questions on this topic. I'm going to take two more and then we're just going to move on. And um, you, you all will know that we're going to do our best to moderate all the questions from today, but it is a large audience. So we'll do our best. All right. So. It says, can you open a secure credit card with banks or financial companies? Secured, is that meaning to put like your own money in the credit card? I think they're thinking about like maybe safety and security around applying for a credit card. Like can, can someone find out if you... We'll have to look that up. I'm not sure. Okay, I can't yeah. give you a straight answer on that. Yeah, I don't know that one. Okay. Either. Okay, let's take one more question on this section. It says, when dealing with poor people who don't have much money, what skills, or so it says, when dealing with poor people who don't have much money or skills and shelters are, sh are short term. Yes, so I can, I can relate to this one. I know that a lot of local shelters are operating programs where, you know, maybe you don't even have a lot of time to really talk to folks that you're serving about finances. What are some short term things that you can do? So I think, I think there are some things that we've covered here, like changing your PIN, that, that is a more short-term uh, solution and in terms of preventing. We are gonna get a lot deeper into things that you can do. So let's, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so we are gonna do a little bit of an interactive. Uh, there's a new tool that I'm gonna have you, uh, have you use, which is the hand raising tool. So if you can see it, there's a screenshot right there on your screen right now as far as where the hand raising tool is. If you can raise your hand, if you felt overwhelmed when helping those you serve to get a handle on their finances. So yeah, give us a hand raise if, if this is something you've dealt with and you've possibly felt overwhelmed when trying to help those you serve deal with their finances. It looks like people are finding the hand raise. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, a lot of you. And I, I wanted to ask this question because Financial literacy is really not, it's not just something that domestic violence victims or survivors are struggling with. I think many of us, uh, the average person or many people that you know are also challenged when it comes to dealing with their finances. So when I, um, when I think about financial literacy, I think a really critical step and a really key part of that journey to uh, building financial self-sufficiency is to get to know your personal finances. Thank you all very much for raising your hands. That's all good. Thank you. Um, so if you know where you're going financially, 
if you know where you want to go, it's really important to start to understand where you are at the moment. So I think that is something that as advocates, we can help someone do is really start to identify where they're currently at in that moment financially. And so a good place to start in terms of that is thinking about what is owned. So what do you own and what is owed? So those are two very different things, but really key to understanding where you're at financially. So things thinking about what you own, those could be assets like homes, cars, bank accounts, or investments. Investments could be anything like a, a mutual fund, a stock, or a bond. And then what is owed or a liability could be credit card balances, loan debt of any kind, so car, student loan, uh, rental leases, or mortgages, all right? So this is really, this section, we'll go to the next slide, is really thinking about conducting a financial inventory. And that's really what I'm talking about, is how do we, how do we really understand where we're at financially so that we can think about where we want to go? So what are your assets? What do you own? And then what do you owe? And it's likely that a survivor will need this information available to them at some point in order to plan for future expenses. So these kinds of questions are going to come up. What are your debts? What do you owe? What do you own? What are your assets? So, um, and then also in addition, you could, if you were in a situation where you needed to uh, make, make a big financial decision, say you need to move homes or potentially even move states or move cities, you, you're really going to want to know sort of what these, where you stand in terms of these things. And maybe you want to sell some of your assets for any kind of additional income. All right. So we're going to use the hand raise tool again. Mm -hmm. And I want you to raise your hand if you've ever made a list of your assets and liabilities or helped a client do this. So have you ever made a list of what of where you're at financially in that way? I want to point your attention to one of our handouts. So in that webinar handouts packet, and I, I did get a couple of thank yous from, from um, attendees. So you are very welcome. We hope you use these activities. The first one is a financial inventory activity. So you could complete this activity with a survivor. And one thing to point out is that a survivor may not have access to all of these individual numbers or documents. So that's gonna come up in our next section about gathering records, but just to point out that you have to be able to do this as information is available to you. So we acknowledge that you may not have access to all these documents, but even if, uh, I wanna state that even if the results are not what you had hoped for in terms of uh, maybe you're you're in a situation that's difficult, but it's best to know where you're at so that you can know where you want to go. Um, does anybody have any questions about that section about uh, conducting a financial inventory activity? So looking at what are your assets and what are your liabilities? Does anybody have any questions about that specifically? Actually, looks like a, not a lot of questions are coming in on that. So maybe that's pretty straightforward. I hope that you will use the financial inventory activity and and uh, potentially use that with some of your clients. It's I think it's a good place to start when you're when you're sitting down and really trying to get a picture of where someone at is at financially. So in our next slide, we're talking about gathering records. It's critical that survivors are able to gain access to records in safe ways. For example, the survivor and partner file a joint tax return. Instead of going to the abuser, the survivor can request a copy of the tax return from the IRS. If the survivor and partner share a bank account, the survivor can contact the bank and request a copy of the records. In order to keep survivors safe, if copies of these records be mailed, be sure that they are sent to a safe address or a post office box. A post office box can be rented often for as less than $20 for six months. Once obtained, the records should be kept in a safe box, such as a bank safe deposit box. The cost varies with the size of the box, but a safe, uh, safe deposit box often costs $20 to $40 a year. As difficult as it can be, it is necessary to get a clear pictures of debts. If the victim has signed for a loan with the abuser, has an apartment lease together, or a credit card in both names, the victim is likely still responsible for these obligations. On the next slide, when it comes to gathering important records, we want to acknowledge that this could be increasingly difficult or potentially dangerous, regardless of whether or not the victim has decided to leave the abuser. An abuser may hide important records or could respond with violence to a victim's um, attempt to locate their personal records. 
Although locating records is important, it's critical that safety remains the top priority. A domestic violence advocate may be able to assist with creating a safety plan that includes uncovering assets and that they may also know of, no, of resources or legal assistance in order to uncover or freeze assets. Now that we have discussed gathering records, let's take a quick pause for any questions that anyone may have on this section. Um, there was one that came in that I thought was interesting, and it says, what about if the spouse or abuser claims that the victim or survivor, if they claim them as a dependent, like on their taxes? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a straight answer. I don't, I don't um, do work um, closely with the IRS, but I do have resources with the IRS that can help answer these questions mm -hmm. so we can get back to the person on that. Okay. Yeah. And I think, um, I think potentially, you know, really working with a legal advocate could be something helpful in, in a lot of these situations. And I know, I know that some of us do have legal advocacy programming within our shelter programming or within our domestic violence programming, but yeah, that I'm not, I'm not quite certain about that, but, but that's something we can look into. Definitely. Someone said, I can answer that. Well, oh, thank you. But I, if you want to go ahead and type me a chat, um, that would be great. If you do have the answer to that, that'd be great. That'd be great. And then it says, um, what if the, the survivor is an immigrant or not legally here? How does some of these things apply? Wow. Um, so that's going to another area that we're not experts on. So that's something that we'll have to look up to. Yeah, I think it can be increasingly complicated. So I think definitely making sure that you are working with a legal advocate if and when possible, particularly around immigration. And um, I think that's a really key mm -hmm. opportunity to seek out legal advocacy. All right, I think we can continue. Thank you all so much for all of your interactive questions. All right, so the next thing is we're gonna do another hand raising activity. So go ahead and raise your hand if those you serve have concerns about where they will live in the future. So thinking about housing and housing accessibility. So um, I think I, I mentioned this, but I am the outreach programs manager and periodically I do make phone calls to different members of NCADB. And I will say that housing is one of the concerns or challenges throughout the US that is really, really top of mind for a lot of people in this field. And I do wanna point out that our next webinar, our next financial education webinar, is really is solely focused on housing. So we are going to be providing just sort of a, a general uh, overview today of what of options for, for housing, but the next webinar is really gonna be focused entirely on that. Mm -hmm. So this is really meant to provide us with a more broad overview of different ways that we can really begin to address economic abuse. So, so I do wanna say that whether a survivor is living in an emergency domestic violence shelter or temporarily with a friend or family member, there will likely become a time when they are going to want to look for more permanent housing. So we, we did list a couple of resources in terms of subsidized housing sources like government programs, potentially religious or community-based organizations do also offer different assistance with housing. And us as advocates or as advocates, um, there are many resources that we typically are available that we are aware of in our communities as far as different resources that exist to offset housing costs because it is a major key part of financial stability. So I'm sure that this has come up. Um, one Another thing to acknowledge is that there are long wait lists for these types of programs. So that is something that we are most likely very aware of in our communities. Um, would, I wanted to, to ask you all, actually, the webinar audience, if you wanted to share some additional housing resources, just go ahead and type them in your questions box. I think sometimes we can, we can use all of our collective knowledge to be able to offer resources to people. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and take a moment and type in a resource that you are aware of as it relates to finding housing. It'd be awesome if we could just get a little bit of get a little bit of resources sharing here. So statewide network, definitely looking into your statewide coalitions. There are a variety of, of nonprofit organizations or community organizations that people are listing here. You could look uh, into your in your tribal entity, pahousingsearch.com, so local realtors, Catholic charities, a variety of nonprofit organizations and city-based organizations, Habitat for Humanity, HUD, 
So the Center for Housing and Urban Development at the federal level. Okay, thank you all. That was really helpful. I think it's it's really important that we share the resources that we know of, so we appreciate that. I'm going to cover a couple of uh, points about housing on our next slide. So when it comes to finding housing, having copies of your credit report can be helpful. So you can always request a copy of your credit report. Most likely a prospective landlord would want to take a look at that. So I would also be prepared or help the survivor be prepared to show pay stubs if they are working and or bank statements to prove their income. These are all going to come up in your search for housing. So there are a couple of things that we're aware of, like the expectation to for someone as a new renter to pay the first first month's rent, potentially a damage deposit or a security deposit, and sometimes even your last month's rent. And um, I really appreciate you all looking or sharing some of those resources because there are nonprofits that really specialize in housing and they know a particular community better than anyone else. So it's good to, to think about building those partnerships. Uh, okay. And then in our housing, in our activity binders or activity PDF, we do have a housing activity. It's called My Housing Plan. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And this will kind of help help someone prepare to look for new housing, such as you know having having references available and having those credit reports and or pay stubs available if you need them. All right, we can go ahead to the next. I mentioned briefly lining up personal and professional references. That's a really key thing to have ready. And um, if you don't have someone right in mind, you could think of a former boss, a religious leader, potentially someone who is a local or community leader in your in your in your city or town, a former professor. Just really thinking outside of the box in terms of who could be a, a reference for you. And a couple of points about if someone is relocating out of the city or out of the state, there's there's definitely some critical issues that you want to consider, and two of those would be transportation and employment. So if you're thinking about relocating to a new uh, to a new city, take a look into what their public transportation is like in advance, if you can, so you can prepare, so you will know what it would be like to move there without a vehicle, if that's the case. And also, if you are receiving any kind of, or if you're working with someone who is receiving any kind of government assistance, make sure that you notify them and look into how those benefits may carry over from one state to another. All right, we're going to take a little pause there if anybody has any questions on finding housing. And this will also give us some insight for our next webinar. So feel free to ask some questions about housing. And at least we will begin to touch on some of these topics, knowing that we'll have a webinar dedicated to that coming up in April. OK. Oh, someone asked. Someone asked me to um, include the resources that were typed in. So I can do that. I'll put them together into like a PDF sheet of just the resources that people listed, and I'll include that as one of the handouts that we'll link to in the follow-up email. Good suggestion. Okay, I'll ask this to you. Okay. In certain shelters, is there an age limit? In certain shelters, is there an age limit for males to enter the shelter? So if a survivor has a 15-year-old son and they're fleeing a relationship, would they not be able to join the mother in the shelter? Are there specific laws that can rule that? Well, that all depends on the different shelters. They all have different rules. They all have different regulations. I couldn't answer for everyone. So that just means um, doing your research at your end. Sure. And in my community or where, where I was um, working locally, there you were able to have a teen enter shelter. So there was not a, an age limit in that case. But as Jeanette said, you want to definitely check in with your local shelter on that. I've just got a couple more comments here. Okay, pulling records from the counties in which the client lived to check for un unlawful detainers or criminal records that may be housing barriers, as well as checking on utilities and making sure there are no outstanding utility bills. Okay. So I think that was more of a suggestion. Thank you, I, I like that. that. There's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. So gathering records again, as it relates to housing and making sure that there are no outstanding utility bills before right. you leave an apartment or before you leave somewhere. Right. That's a very good suggestion. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and move on. As we move on to the next section about developing a spending plan, 
please use your hand raised tool in your control panel and please raise your hand if you have helped the survivor create a monthly spending plan or budget. Looks like there's a lot. Yes, great. Thank you. That's good. As you know from one, this previous section on conducting a financial inventory, it is a snapshot of where you stand today financially. However, to maintain financial stability, it's wise to have an accurate monthly spending plan. In the webinar one handout in the control panel, we have included a monthly spending plan activity. It's four pages. We recommend that you tailor these activities to the specific needs of those you serve. For the monthly spending plan, it is important to have an accurate picture of sources of income and the exact amount that you can expect to make and spend each month. Many people have unrealistic ideas of their actual income. Similarly, many people have no idea where their money goes. Listing your expenses is the only sure way of tracking where your money is going. Here's an example of an expense that is open over overlook, which needs to be included in a monthly plan. Buying coffee at a daily daily at a coffee shop or every other day, that could add up. The cost of an average latte is between three to five dollars. What we don't often consider is that this comes out to be $25 a week. It is also incredibly important to list savings as an expense. This is known as paying yourself first. By putting money into the savings, survivors will be able to cope with expenses such as attorney fees, relocation costs, counseling services, and other expenses that may occur if they decide to leave an abusive relationship. Remember that committing to making saving money monthly a habit is more important than the actual amount of money deposited each month. On the next slide, when we are developing a spending plan, we also have to account for unexpected expenses. In a common example, we may need to replace a couple of tires on a car. We may need to choose to use a credit card or borrow money to cover costs. But now that we don't have any extra money at the end of the month like we may have planned, how can we learn from these unexpected financial crises and how do we get back on track? Because things like this usually do come up. It is helpful to always be on the lookout for ways to cut expenses or decrease expenses. Managing money is all about making consistent, smart choices so that over time a survivor can become financially stable. Now that we discuss finding, um, developing a spending plan, and before we cover our last section about employment, let's take a quick look, pause for any questions that anyone may have on this section. Great, and thank you all so much for your ongoing questions. It's been very interesting so far to look look through. There was one, one someone pointed out something about um, budgeting in terms of assisting clients with working towards decreasing the amount spent sp spent on smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. has been helpful. So it's it's just that example of the latte, like yeah. buying a box of cigarettes for probably ten dollars or so right. per pack. It really does add up over time. So just thinking about and trying to relate to the folks that you are working with in terms of what they're spending money on, helping them understand how to create that spending plan. But we also don't want to be judgmental. Sometimes um, you do need something to um, de-stress. Yeah, right? absolutely. So uh, please try to consider all the things that they could um, think about in savings. And it takes a lot of um, innovative strategies to think about. All right, this um, question was, any suggestions for gaining short-term financial stability, especially for those who are undocumented and maybe may not be utilizing credit or debit cards? And I, I just want to say, I, I appreciate this question. Actually, it seems to be, if this is giving me something, th something to think about for uh, upcoming topics for webinars. So I think we really need to specifically think about doing a webinar on this. So I don't have the answers or I didn't come prepared to address that as much on this webinar. So but it is something we will look into Okay, thinking about undocumented. We, I have encountered people using uh, the envelope system where they just put um, money aside to pay. Perhaps it could be that insurance bill that's due every six months. Um, but if they put small amounts in it, they can have that six month payment in the envelope system. Um, but it's, it's uh, a way of exercising kind of um, patience and be able not to touch that stash at all. Mm -hmm. uh, someone asked, how can they budget with no income? I, I don't have any quick answers for that. Um, 
it just it all depends on the different scenarios uh, you have any idea I'm just thinking very... maybe maybe budgeting or thinking about how how you're allocating any kind of government resources or any resources that you may be able to acquire so if you don't have any income I think focusing pr primarily on maybe looking for income probably would be more immediate than budgeting so you have to think about where someone is at in terms of what they need in that immediate okay. moment. And maybe now is not the best time to think about budgeting if there isn't any right. income. But we're going to the next section about work. Yes, about work. And so that, that'll be sort of the, the last section that we'll cover is around handling security at work and job hunting. Mm -hmm. So definitely um, thinking about any last questions that you may have for this first webinar, knowing that uh, this is the first in an installment of six webinars that are going to sort of break down different aspects of financial literacy. So, right. all right, so we'll go on to handling security at work. So another hand raising opportunity. So go ahead and raise your hand if you are working with survivors who are currently employed. So how many of you have clients that are currently employed? Thank you, a lot of hands are being raised. So on, that, on this topic, um, we, we wanted to point out a couple things, but just thinking about how, how important it can be for a survivor to be employed not only just for the financial piece, but also in terms of gaining valuable skills as well as relationships in the community. So having that employment can be very beneficial if, it, if it's possible. So you may have a client that is employed who, that they're wondering how to disclose to their employer whether or not that they're in an abusive relationship. So they're deciding whether they would like to disclose to their employer something deeply personal to them. And I just wanted to help shine some light on some pros and cons as far as why it may be good to disclose or why it may not be. So I would think that, in my opinion, the pro side is that the pro side of disclosing is that it could actually inspire that employer to, um, to create some better safety precautions for all employees. So by one person speaking to an employer, this could really call to attention, you know, something really important and the employer could really take a, take many steps forward to create new human resources policies or just create overall better policies and procedures around working with survivors within a workplace. So it could end up being a positive thing, but we do acknowledge that, you know, disclosing to someone could end up becoming, um, becoming potentially, it could be sort of not beneficial to that person. They could um, have an employer that says they don't want to get involved or someone who's just not generally not very helpful to them. So those are the pros and cons. Helping someone to sort of prepare for doing that could be really helpful for them. And um, if, an, if an employer or I'm sorry, if someone who is employed decides to inform their employer, it could be helpful to work with an advocate. So as an advocate, you can sort of assist them with creating a safety plan that really addresses not only their personal safety, but also their safety while at work. So that's really important. And um, we know that it could be really, it could even be feel embarrassing or vulnerable to talk to an employer about something like domestic violence. So having an advocate to support them through that could be very helpful. We do have a handout that is in your handouts packet that talks a little bit more about pl a plan for managing your job. So that's called a plan for managing my job activity. And you may want to go ahead and fill that out or work, work on an activity like that before someone goes back to work or and or thinking through how work will be. So on the next slide, using the hand raise tool in your control panel, please raise your hand if you have clients who are currently looking for employment. Great, thank you for answering. We all know that looking for work can be difficult. Before heading out to look for a job, it can be helpful for survivors to take a look at their skills and whether their skills are current. In the webinar one handout in your control panel, we have included a My Job Hunting Plan activity as mentioned. It can be helpful for survivors to work with a job placement or nonprofit organizations that can offer help with updating certain skills such as contacting prospective employers. Domestic violence advocates may be aware of resources in their communities that offer free or low cost services to meet the needs of survivors. It can be incredibly helpful to join a support group for abused victims even while job hunting. Looking for work can be discouraging for even the most confident individuals, let alone people who are rebuilding their lives after a domestic violence. 
Talking with others who understand the situation can help individuals cope with the stress of looking for work. There are many ways to apply for jobs, for example, in person, on the internet, or through a job placement center. One of the best ways to find work is through networking with employed friends and family. It's tough to beat a personal recommendation. Last Christmas, my friend sent out 2,000 Christmas cards and kept saying, my husband's looking for a job. And out of that Christmas um, uh, send out, he got five or six uh, chances to interview with a potential employer. Ooh. There are many ways, like I said, to um, apply for a job, and that's just one of very many ways and a creative way of doing it. A domestic violence advocate may be able to help a survivor prepare for and complete job interviews by helping them polish up outdated resumes, finding resources in their community to obtain good interview skills, and doing a mock interview. Now that we discuss employment, let's take a quick pause for any questions that anyone may have on this section. Any questions? Okay. Yes. It says, can you claim unemployment benefits due to domestic violence? I don't know that answer. That's a good one. Yeah, that's, I'm not really, I'm not very versed on unemployment benefits, but I think um, that would be definitely something to, to look into in terms of your local unemployment office, but okay. I'm not certain that that could be a reason right. to claim it. Yeah. I'm not sure though. I'm not sure. And it says, what if work is not an option due to disability or age? Hmm. That's another one that we'll have to look into. Well, I think it's it's also just a tough call, yeah. you know, um, gaining income if you're if you are disabled or not able to work, I think um, is definitely an issue that many people face. So I think in that in those cases, sometimes there are actually culturally specific organizations that are dealing with or that are working specifically with victims who are disabled um, and can provide additional resources on that. Right. There are so many good questions here. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and also just a lot of comments. And that's what I'm noticing is that we will take a look through a lot of these comments and see if we can synthesize them into some resources to be able to share with you all. Yes. So there are people even answering questions that we can't answer. So I really appreciate yes. that. And I'll go ahead and look through those and synthesize those into some kind of more concrete resource that we can use. And I appreciate that. Okay, if a survivor gets fired because of abuse and a, and someone is harassing them at work, what could someone do to, to sort of navigate a situation like that? Wow. That's, that's something I would like to look into closely. And I think we, we kind of touched on that a little bit in the handling security at work section. So I think those are, when you look at that, and if you are experiencing abuse while at work, I think there are definitely some safety concerns around maybe wanting to disclose something to your employer and or working with a domestic violence advocate who can make sure to include a plan for your safety while at work in your overall safety plan as a survivor. So I think that, you know, each situation is so unique and, and uniquely complex that it's hard to be able to give you an exact, um, you know, answer on some of these deeper questions. But that's we just really are. We're advocating that, you know, that local advocates and people who are doing this work are informed about resources, about how to help keep people safe while at work. Okay, um, so let's let's go ahead and take some more general questions. Um, so let's we'll go on to our summary and then we will spend the last 10 minutes here going and answering more of your questions. And I will see if I can, um, they're just coming in very fast. And so I'll go ahead and, and see if I can um, sort of re relay back some of these other things to you. So in summary, we have talked today we've talked a little bit about preventing financial abuse in general gaining control of your finances as well as protecting your safety and um so that was that was sort of the extent of the agenda for today's webinar and knowing that housing is going to be addressed in a future webinar we're really going to be unpacking and getting into some other topics like uh, creating and sustaining financial well-being so thinking about just overall financial health and wellness and good good solid foundations for financial for financial stability. We're gonna be thinking about income, spending and savings. We're gonna think in October about planning for the holidays, which is a very important topic. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the series, we are gonna talk about retirement, which isn't 
typically something, knowing that there are so many advocates on these webinars, it is something that we as a, as a whole or as a community definitely want to focus on for ourselves and, um, and also potentially for some of our clients. So that's sort of what's to come in the series. And before we get into more of your questions, I want to take a moment and just thank you all so much yes. for all the work that you all are doing on the in the local communities and on uh, really face to face with survivors. And uh, we appreciate all of what all your amazing questions and just your overall interest in this topic. It's pretty tremendous how many people wanted to hear hear about this topic and that shows us how important it is. So I also wanted to share that if you as advocates want to share this particular PowerPoint with your other colleagues and other advocates in the community, you can also find this on www.financialworkshopkits.org. All the worksheets, activities, FAQs, and ways of talking to the audience are all listed there. It's customizable, it's easy, It's you can download it. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to be a member and everything is free. All, all the resources are vetted by the National Endowment for Financial Education, who has funded this resources and to make it free for all those that need this information. Yeah, so just such a great resource. Make sure you're going to nefi.org to access those resources, the financial workshop kits. I'm just getting like a ton of thank yous, but also just ask, people are asking where to find the handout. So I'm just gonna explain that again real quick, which is in your control panel. So if you go to the control panel, there's a drop down that says handouts. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you, you get that and it will also be sent out in the follow-up e email that goes out tomorrow. So it's gonna go out 24 hours after this webinar, be tomorrow at about this time, you'll receive that in your inbox. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it says, can I repeat the website? Yes, so that's nefi.org. Do you want to talk a little so, more about that? Um, NEFI is www. NEFI is, stands for National Endowment Financial Education, nefe.org. My website is under that parent website, which is Financial Workshop Kits with an S.org. And that resource is free and vetted by NEFI to give to you as a resource for your community and those that you help financialworkshopkits.org. All right, and it, someone did ask about an evaluation. So as soon as you exit the webinar, you will receive a survey. It's just five quick, quick questions and you can add some comments in there as well for us. And uh, we do appreciate all of your comments. And like I said, I will go through some of the Q&A from today's webinar and see if I can pull out some of the really, really good resources that have been shared, particularly around housing. But I think there have been some others that I can also pull out. So before the, the uh, handout goes out or before the email goes out, I'll synthesize some more of this info so that you have even some additional resources. But make sure you check out that workshop. It's a, a bunch of activities all in a PDF. Um, someone did ask about CEUs. No, we don't. We actually do not provide any um, social work CEUs for this webinar. However, there is a certificate of participation that you can use just to show that you were a part of the webinar. And that will, the link is in your handouts as well as will be in the follow-up email as well. And yeah, a lot of comments on, on serving undocumented people. And, um, and I really appreciate that. That's giving me a lot of insight for our next or for a future topic. So we really appreciate all of that. Yes, you will be getting the handouts via email. I think we're pretty good. I feel like everybody's yeah. asking sort of similar things. We'll be following up with everybody via email and we really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy Monday. People are just